welcome to another episode of Untold Legends, where I take a deep dive into your favorite fictional stories. Last time on the Metroid Timeline series, I detailed how Nintendo modernized a classic, updating Samus' original adventure on the NES by modern standards for the Game Boy Advance. And Samus set out on her Zero mission. She returned home to Zebes to find a transformed planet corrupted by Mother Brain and her space pirates. And after fighting her way through Mother Brain's most powerful generals and Mother Brain herself, Samus destroyed the entire space pirate operation on the planet after receiving the legendary fully powered Varia suit. After her Zero mission, Samus' next chronological adventure was also her first jump into a fully 3D world. The, at the time, GameCube exclusive Metroid Prime. The road to Metroid in 3D was a long one, with a history that stretched all the way back to the mid-90s. After the era of the Super Nintendo, the Metroid series had a problem. Sure, Samus had an appearance in Smash Bros. as a playable character, and eventually, in 2002's Metroid Fusion, another 2D adventure release, but between 1994 and 2002, the series was on a hiatus. What happened? Two words. Super Metroid. Super Metroid was too good. To this day, it's considered by many gamers to be the best Metroid game of all time. One of the greatest video games of all time in general. Nintendo struck gold, but then the question rises, how do you surpass the quality of Super Metroid? 1996, the Nintendo 64 releases, and the gaming world jumps on the 3D trend. Even Nintendo's biggest franchises made the jump from 2D to 3D mostly successfully. The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario, Donkey Kong, but fans waited patiently for Metroid 64. That never came. In fact, the idea for a Metroid 64 was something Nintendo was actively pursuing, referencing it several times, but it never entered production. Simply put, they couldn't settle on any concrete ideas on how to introduce Samus into a 3D environment. According to Nintendo's own Yoshio Sakamoto, he desired to make a Metroid 64, but when he held the Nintendo 64 controller in his hands, he couldn't imagine how it could be used to control Samus. Perhaps it was still too early for Samus to join the rest of her friends in a 3D environment. Nintendo even approached another as of now unnamed company to make a Nintendo 64 Metroid, but the offer was declined. Turns out they didn't have the confidence to create a game that would compare to Super Metroid. Sakamoto took the declined offer as a compliment. And so the Nintendo 64's lifespan would come to an end with no Metroid 64 as part of his library, as gamers wondered, would Samus ever return? By the turn of the century, Nintendo was getting closer to bringing Metroid into 3D. And the solution would be found outside of Japan, with an American video game developer called Retro Studios. They were created in 1998 in a collaboration between Nintendo and Jeff Spangenberg, the founder of Iguana Entertainment. Retro Studios was originally set to create more mature GameCube exclusive games and develop their own first-person shooter engine. When Shigeru Miyamoto visited their offices in the year 2000, he was impressed by what he saw and suggested that they work on a brand new Metroid game. With Nintendo's new console, the GameCube, on the horizon, a much more powerful console than Nintendo 64, it was finally time to figure out how Metroid would work in a 3D world. Originally, this new Metroid experience was planned to have a third-person perspective, but after Miyamoto's input, Nintendo and Retro Studios settled on a first-person viewpoint. He believed that third-person shooting for Metroid wasn't very intuitive. Everything Retro Studios had already developed had to be scrapped. But it had to be more than just another basic first-person shooter. It needed to retain the feel of Metroid and the exploration factor that Super Metroid essentially perfected. They focused on making a game where the first-person shooting aspect was important, but secondary to exploring a massive environment. As work on the game progressed, it became a collaboration between Nintendo EAD, their largest software development division at the time, Nintendo R&D 1, and Retro Studios. Nintendo and Retro worked on the overall design of the game, Nintendo specifically worked on the music, while Retro focused on art and engineering. And some elements from Super Metroid were set to make an appearance. The Awakened Behemoth Kraid would have been a boss battle having survived the events of Super Metroid, this time protected with a metal dome over his head, but sadly he had to be cut for time reasons. In August of the year 2000, the world got its first look at the new Metroid game, as part of a GameCube tech demo montage shown at the video game trade show Space World. Then in May 2001, early footage of the game was shown at E3. Excitement for Metroid Prime was growing while another year passed, and it released in North America on November 18th, 
2002, just one day after the 2D Game Boy Advance Metroid Fusion. In fact, if Metroid Prime was completed at least once, and a Game Boy Advance was linked to the GameCube with Metroid Fusion, Samus could use the Fusion suit in Metroid Prime. It was merely cosmetic, but it was a pretty cool feature. Metroid Prime, Samus' first steps into 3D, worked. The cold silence of space only punctuates the feeling of death that emanates from this virtually lifeless planet. Only one thing is alive and well here. Evil. And it must be destroyed. Decimated. Exterminated. But first, it must be found. It was a huge success, becoming critically acclaimed and selling more than a million copies in North America alone. For the first time, players could truly feel like Samus, going behind the visor and seeing these alien worlds from her perspective. Glare from the environment would reveal her face in the reflection of her visor, beam switching is controlled from Samus's arm cannon with Samus's hand gestures, different spectrums of light were visible with different upgrades. This truly was a Metroid experience, revolutionized, and paved the way for an entire new sub-series of Metroid stories. Now you know the story behind the creation of Metroid Prime, but what was the in-game story? How did the Metroid universe continue to evolve after Samus destroyed the planet Zebes pirate operation? As a reminder, just like last time, this video is not meant to be a gameplay walkthrough. Everything is organized in a way to tell the story of Metroid Prime in an understandable manner. With that, I introduce you to the Metroid Timeline Part 3, The Great Poison of Talon 4. Planet Zebes near the end of Samus's Zero Mission. With the destruction of Kraid, Ridley, and Mother Brain, Space Pirate High Command was in complete disarray. Requests for backup forces went unanswered, and Samus was inside one of the Space Pirate motherships wrecking havoc with her fully powered suit. It was clear that the Zebes base was lost, and the entire operation was about to be obliterated. In response, the three remaining Space Pirate research frigates that were orbiting the planet at the time, the Orpheon, Syriacus, and Volparagon, fled, disappearing into different parts of the galaxy. Frigate Orpheon docked at a space pirate outpost known as Outpost Vortex while the current situation was assessed. All of its cargo and experiments were still intact, including a batch of Metroids that were taken off the planet, and there was no sign of pursuit. Zebes had fallen silent. All space pirate ground personnel was presumed dead, either killed by Samus or destroyed in the massive explosion. But this wouldn't be the end of the space pirates. The surviving frigates began searching for a proper secondary base, and eventually one potential candidate was found in the spiral sector of the galaxy. The planet Talon IV, a world located in orbit around FS-176, the same solar system Zebes was located in. The space pirates detected a massive energy spike coming from the planet and immediately sent units to investigate the cause. They returned with what seemed to be samples of an unstable radioactive energy source. The space pirates immediately saw the potential of harnessing such a power and Frigate Orpheon was sent to establish an operating base on Talon IV. Over the next two to three years, Samus continued tracking space pirate activity and disrupted it where she could. She became legendary among their kind, feared as the hunter clad in metal. Orders were to terminate her on site and her armor of unknown origin salvaged, and soon enough the space pirates would unintentionally be the cause of their own downfall. One of the first species to be experimented on inside the Orpheon were parasites native to Talon IV. The frigate also carried three parasite queens that were genetically enhanced to grow much larger in size than natural. At the same time, they became more aggressive and eventually escaped their stasis tanks. They caused incredible destruction throughout the ship and slaughtered much of the space pirate crew. Two of the queens were successfully destroyed and the third one was injured. It fell into the ship's reactor core and damaged it. The frigate Orpheon was completely crippled, drifting aimlessly in space around Talon IV. 
The remaining space pirates on board sent out a distress signal, a signal they did not intend for Samus to pick up on her gunship scanners, beginning the events of Metroid Prime. Once Samus entered the Orpheon, she discovered a massacre. An enormous creature lay dead on the floor, one of the mutated parasite queens, and bodies littered the area as parasites fed on them. The bodies belonged to the space pirates. Samus did find some survivors throughout the ship, mostly injured or alone, but the space pirates had no intention in communicating with Samus. Following orders, they opened fire instantly and forced Samus to respond with lethal action. Even after being heavily injured or dying, the space pirates still attacked into their last breath. It was clear to Samus that this operation had been here for a while. Frigate Orpheon was a major find, and she wondered why it was orbiting this particular planet. While investigating what caused the ship's power loss, Samus discovered the reactor core, with the remaining Parasite Queen still inside. The damage on the reactor core from the Parasite Queen was irreparable, and it went critical. Samus had to get back to her gunship immediately, before the frigate was destroyed with her inside of it. Explosions rocked the ship, automatic turrets activated, the Parasite hatchlings laid by the Queens covered the hallways of the ship. Samus was easily equipped to withstand those dangers, but on her way back to the entrance to the Orpheon, she stumbled upon one of the Space Pirates' most top secret experiments. A danger that Samus believed was behind her. mechanical monstrosity she just witnessed resembled Ridley, but it couldn't be. Last time she saw him, he was a smoldering pile of flesh. With the ship falling apart and her suit damaged from a heavy impact, she was in no position to be chasing the beast. All the upgrades she received on Zebes for her suit malfunctioned. All she had access to was her standard power beam and power suit in space form. With moments to spare, Samus made it back to the ship in time to witness the mysterious life form fly towards the surface of the planet. If somehow this was truly Ridley, she had to track him down, but he was fast. Before entering Talon 4's atmosphere, Samus lost track of her target. Investigation at the ground level was required, and unknown to Samus, she was landing on a dying world in need of a savior. Was it the space pirate signal that lured her here, or was it truly a cry for help from Talon 4 itself?
Once Samus exited her ship, she found a world teeming with life forms, but something was abnormal about the readings in the environment. The animals, even the plant life, had traces of a strong radioactivity, and many of the animals she encountered were highly aggressive and agitated, possibly unnaturally mutated. Something was off about Talon 4, a planet that should be able to support life comfortably, but in such a radioactive environment, a typical human being wouldn't last long. In a way, it reminded her of home, the harsh environment of Zebes. But this wasn't natural. Samus traveled through the lush, rain-soaked jungle following a strong energy signal. The same energy signal that initially lured the space pirates to Talon 4. Not far from the landing site, Samus discovered ruins that were unmistakably Chozo in origin. From the architecture to the very technology the Chozo used to manage the planet, including a hive mecha, a Chozo combat drone currently infested with war wasps, and an incinerator originally intended for waste disposal that was out of control and agitating more wasps. Samus dealt with the threats of the abandoned technology and studied the historical records left behind in the Chozo language. Those writings revealed to Samus the mystery of Talon IV. It was once a beautiful biological paradise, and when the Chozo spread through the galaxy, many chose to call Talon IV home. The Chozo that came here were much different than the Chozo from Zebes that depended on technology to control their environment and survive. The Talon IV Chozo left much of their advanced technology behind, using only what was required to survive, and embrace nature building structures with natural stone and branches, they became one with the environment. They began studying the very nature of the universe and reality itself, looking spiritually inward. The Chozo developed a deep understanding of the flow of time, and due to this incredible knowledge, some Chozo began having prophetic visions of a terrifying future apocalypse that was difficult to interpret. Fountains on their world poured darkness instead of water. A parasitic worm devoured the planet from inside, while Talon IV rotted away slowly. But these same visions also provided hope, speaking of a great defender meant to deliver the world from evil. Many of the Chozo that studied the secrets of the universe and interpreted these prophecies also discovered higher levels of existence beyond the veil of reality and chose to leave their bodies behind to explore these new realms. They ascended to the edges of space and time and witnessed the evolution of the galaxy from a dimension beyond. But these same Chozo would never forget their home of Talon IV and remained partially tied to their ancestral land. Fifty years before Samus arrived, the day the Chozo feared came. A large object from the stars of unknown origins violently smashed into Talon IV. It left a huge scar on the surface as it landed in an enormous crater deep within the planet. Soon after, Talon IV began changing. Ash and debris from the impact covered the planet, ecosystems experienced severe weather and extreme changes, and many of Talon IV's natural life forms died off. At the center of the impact, a highly radioactive substance seeped into the planet, mutating and corrupting anything it touched. Talon IV was dying from within. After the impact, the remaining Chozo either reluctantly left the planet or stayed, eventually dying out. Much of the natural water sources they depended on were compromised from the substance within. They called it the Great Poison. As the planet slowly died, the Chozo that ascended beyond their physical forms were pulled back into Talon IV. The Great Poison was creating such suffering that their connection to the planet caused them to exist as spirits, somewhere stuck between reality and a higher dimension, but still able to interact with the environment. As long as the planet was in distress, they couldn't return to their dimension. Something had to be done to contain the Great Poison. In order to save themselves, Talon IV had to be saved. The Chozo spirits found the source of the Great Poison, the Impact Crater, and used their ability to interact with the physical world to construct a great temple around it they called the Cradle, with a seal in the middle called a Cipher. The seal would contain the Great Poison and slow down Talon IV's complete destruction. Twelve mystical Chozo totems around the Cipher would act as locks to prevent entry. Each totem was powered by the Cipher, which the Chozo spirits divided into twelve artifacts they hid around the planet. The only way to activate each totem and unlock the Cipher to the Impact Crater was to bring all twelve artifacts back together. For the time being, the Chozo spirits believed their solution would give the prophesized Defender time to arrive. 
Instead of a defender arriving, the Chozo spirits witness the savage space pirates arrive on Talon IV. The invaders were seen experimenting with the great poison and forming bases on the planet. They also discovered the cradle and attempt to destroy it to gain access to the impact crater, but the space pirates had no technology that could destroy the mystical temple. Enraged, the Chozo spirits attack space pirate forces getting close to the artifacts. They phased in and out of existence and few space pirates survived their encounters. Then one day, Samus arrived. The Chozo spirits knew of the young human raised on Zebes, infused with their essence and clad in the armor of their people. They referred to her as the Newborn. Could she be the savior that was prophesized? Without her knowledge, the Chozo spirits watched over her and guided her. But time was running short, and not all Chozo spirits' minds remained intact. The longer they stayed in this dimension, the more compromised they became. The great poison of Talon IV didn't only affect biological life on the planet, it also affected the minds of the Chozo spirits, creating a sect of Chozo known as the Turned. The Turned were lost, their minds corrupted by the great poison, and they became extremely violent to anything or anyone that crossed into Chozo lands. After encountering the corrupted Chozo spirits of the Turned, Samus ventured deeper into the ruins of the Chozo civilization. It held many secrets, and although these Chozo had mostly left their dependence on technology behind, many of their relics remained that could repair Samus's suit and re-enable many of her weapon systems. And she also began collecting many of the artifacts to unlock the cradle thanks to hints left behind for her by the Chozo spirits guiding her. But she still hadn't witnessed how drastically the Great Poison was affecting Talon IV's wildlife. The entire ecosystem was truly untamed disaster. The Chozo ruins themselves were once the location of a vast Chozo city, and life flourished due to a fountain of pure water that flowed through the entire civilization. But when the great poison began spreading through the planet, a monstrous bioform fed from its power and made the fountain its permanent home, the Flagra. Originally, Flagra was an ordinary plant, one of the many in the area that the Chozo held sacred and placed as a centerpiece in the city's sun chamber. With the arrival of the Great Poison, Flagra fed from it and grew constantly with the help of constant sunlight beaming down on it. Its roots spread throughout the entire city and caused multiple structures to collapse and it secreted fluid that tainted the fountain's pure waters. Disease and death spread through the city as the water became toxic and corrosive. The creature tried defending itself, but Samus's scans made her realize that without constant sunlight to feed from, Flagra couldn't maintain its strength. Flagra was destroyed, and with its destruction, clean water began flowing again from the fountain. The first hint of salvation for a dying world. Just beyond the ruins, Samus found a familiar site. The elevator technology that the Chozo on Zebes also used. The Chozo were experts at building underground transportation systems and connecting different parts of planets together for easy access. In Talon IV's case, all areas of the planet were connected to an underground volcanic region, located below the crust and consumed by a blistering heat. Thanks to Samus's Varia suit upgrade she received on Zebes, the extreme temperatures wouldn't be an issue. The Chozo called this fiery region the Magmore Caverns named after the deadly magmore serpents that made their homes inside the magma coming from within the planet. Although few creatures had the ability to survive inside the caverns, some adapted and even flourished. But the biggest danger Samus faced were the environmental hazards. The natural flame jets powered by the powerful pressure found underground, and the lava lakes were obstacles that even her suit couldn't withstand for very long. 
deeper into the cavern, Samus made a shocking discovery. She wasn't the only one exploring the caverns. Space pirates were here. It was impossible that these were survivors of the frigate Orpheon crashing into the planet below, not this far below the planet's surface. The space pirates were here for much longer, and they were using geothermal equipment in the caverns to power their operation secretly. They were also harvesting rare crystals for sale in black markets. Samus's experiences with the space pirates in the past taught her that their plans were never simple. She had to find out why they were on Talon IV. She followed their trail to another lift that took her to the planet's surface into a region with more extreme temperatures on the opposite end. Fendrana Drifts. This ice valley was a frozen wasteland covered in canyons and caves, isolated from the rest of the planet and only accessible through Magmore Caverns lifts. At some point when the climate was warmer and the ecosystem was managed by the Chozo, it was home to large bodies of water and Chozo villages, now frozen ruins left behind in silence. The wildlife that adapted to the cold in Fendrana Drifts were also affected by the Great Poison, much larger in size than they naturally should be and aggressive beyond understanding, including the native Shegoth. Through most of her journey, Samus encountered young smaller ones, but the adults were large predatory beasts capable of absorbing energy. The Shegoth was a natural predator irradiated by its environment's corruption by the Great Poison. It was a truly bizarre substance, and Samus believed it was no simple radioactive fluid. It carried some sort of life-giving properties, perhaps it was even alive in its own way, a theory that was proven correct when she encountered an extremely dangerous space pirate project that was dumped in Fendrana Drifts. The experiment carried the name Thardis, originally conceived by the space pirates as Project Titan. They recognized the great poison didn't only affect organic life and began infusing it into non-organic matter. To their surprise, the rocks infused with the poison developed to sentience and came to life. Project Titan was deemed uncontrollable, and when it encountered Samus, Thardis reacted violently. She had to find the weak portions of its body holding the entire thing together before it crushed her. Thardis was demolished, and Samus was determined to uncover the extent of the space pirate experiments. They were known to genetically modify their own troops normally. If they were using the Great Poison on rocks, she could only imagine what they were doing to themselves. Eventually, the trail of the space pirates led to a secret entrance. There was no hiding their activities anymore. Samus had stumbled upon a space pirate base they called Glacier One. It was a massive research facility heavily protected by their troops and separated into two research lab complexes, Hydra and Aether. The space pirates had been experimenting with the Great Poison for some time and had an official name for it. Phazon. Just as Thardis had demonstrated, Phazon wasn't just a radioactive fluid. Although they had no answers about its origin before arriving on Talon IV, they knew that some sort of meteor-like object brought it to the planet, and under further study, Phazon was determined to have life-giving properties, and was capable of mutating organic life forms that were strong enough to withstand its poison, something Samus had witnessed all over Talon IV. Meanwhile, it was believed that the Phazon would continue spreading and poisoning its surrounding environment until an unknown final result. 
the Space Pirates established an entire science team on Talon IV specifically to develop Phazon use as a weapon. Their initial tests exposed the planet's parasites and parasite queens to Phazon. With each infusion, the test subjects became larger and stronger, perhaps even able to survive on any planet the Space Pirates dropped them on. But Phazon wasn't exactly stable. After a third infusion of the substance, most organisms that survived were uncontrollably violent. And after a fourth infusion, there was a 100% death rate. Studying Phazon also came at a price for many space pirates. Similar to what the Chozo spirits were experiencing, exposure for too long caused madness, hallucinations, and physical ailments like muscle spasms and erratic respiration. In time, with enough research, the space pirates were confident enough to begin combining their DNA with Phazon. In an experiment they called Project Helix. This is why the Space Pirates chose Talon IV. If they could successfully weaponize Phazon, their army would be almost unstoppable. The experiments with early test subjects were a disaster. The Phazon injections increased muscle mass tremendously, but at the same time it destroyed the subject's brain tissue rapidly, causing mental degradation. While searching through the base, Samus encountered some of their most successful test subjects, the Elite Pirates. At first, barely any lived to maturity, but by using different strains of Phazon and pirate DNA, some successfully were ready for field testing. And the reason the Space Pirates chose to construct a base in such a cold region became apparent when Samus discovered a horrifying weapon. Metroids. The Space Pirates had taken Metroids from Zebes, and their weakness to cold made the Metroids slower and easier to control, in theory. The Space Pirates were infusing them with Phazon also. The Stasis tanks held the younger ones fairly well, but the larger older Metroids well into their Phazon experiments became too violent, and had to be moved into quarantine deeper into the planet's caves. Samus had to shut down their operation as soon as possible and wipe out the Metroids in the area. The Metroids were incredibly deadly, and even stronger with exposure to Phazon. But the final result Project Helix came in the form of Elite Pirate Upsilon. The code name for a space pirate that was successfully mutated beyond expectations. A monster they called the Omega Pirate. The Omega Pirate constantly absorbed Phazon without losing its mind, and retained its weapon handling skills perfectly. Space pirates believed it to be almost invincible, capable of healing itself, and had the ability to cloak itself using a different spectrum of light. Their first successful fully Phazon powered pirate would become the standard for their forces if Samus failed to stop Project Helix, and Samus was able to determine a weakness. While the creature was healing, it was vulnerable. It was overly reliant on Phazon, and her x-ray visor could easily see it while it was camouflaged. With the defeat of the Omega Pirate, Project Helix was dead. The Space Pirates had never anticipated that Samus would find their operation, and most of the survivors evacuated to the Phazon Mines, and they unintentionally gave Samus an extremely powerful weapon. As the Omega Pirate's body broke apart, Samus was bathed in the Phazon energy that poured from its body. Chozo technology was truly a wonder. Instead of harming Samus, the Phazon interacted with her suit, and the suit systems adapted to its properties, creating a new Phazon suit. The Phazon suit provided Samus greater protection than ever, and made her completely immune to the blue Phazon found in the mines. It also gave her the ability to absorb Phazon directly into her arm cannon, and blast it out as beams of pure energy. 
With her new suit, the Space Pirates created an enemy more dangerous than anything they'd faced before, and Samus would prove who the prime hunter in the galaxy was. As the Space Pirates evacuated from Glacier 1, Samus tore through those defenses into the mines, a region where the Space Pirates dug deep caves in order to mine pure Phazon, with a hazy pink sky above from the heavy pollution they created. The threat of Project Helix was taken care of, but the Metroids remained, and Samus found all sorts of new breeds changed by the Phazon energy. The Space Pirates left alive were ready to put up a fight. They were amazed by Samus's Chozo suit technology and actively studied her in order to recreate it, but were barely successful. They were able to implement a form of her power beams in some of their elite forces, but were also vulnerable to the same type of energy. They even tried duplicating her Morph Ball technology, but attempts at creating suits to allow for it resulted in broken and mangled bodies. Nothing was even coming close to stopping Samus. She obliterated the mining operations and the Space Pirates attempting to hold their ground and the Metroids that were in the area. The Space Pirates carefully cataloged where they were quarantined, so the Metroids' extermination was enough to ensure they didn't spread to other parts of the planet. The only task that Samus had left was to finish tracking down the 12 artifacts to unlock the cradle. Whatever was inside the impact crater had to be dealt with. According to space pirate logs she uncovered, they believed there was a massive organism down below the planet, feeding and causing the Phazon to continue spreading. And with the Phazon suit, she could withstand the extreme radiation inside Ground Zero. The Space Pirates had collected some of the artifacts in an attempt to destroy them without success, and with all 12 in hand, Samus returned to the Cradle, ready to face the source of the Phazon. The creature she encountered on the Orpheon reappeared. To Samus's shock, it in fact was Ridley, who was waiting for her to successfully open the entrance. Face to face with her worst enemy, Samus didn't display the same fear for him that she once did. Although he was stronger than he was before, she destroyed him once, she would do it again. After the destruction of the Zebes operation, Space Pirate High Command ordered that Ridley's burned and broken body be found. Using technology learned from creating the Mecha Ridley robot and their own genetic experiments, Ridley was slowly regenerated as Geoform 187, codenamed Meta Ridley. His regeneration was painful, but it resulted in increased strength, reinforced with cybernetic modules and armor plating. Ridley was regrown at a cellular level. He hated Samus with every fiber of his being and wanted revenge for what she did to him. But Samus believed what she saw in front of her was a pathetic shell of what Ridley used to be. He was being kept alive by mechanical parts, even having artificial wings. And his artificial heart was exposed. Samus couldn't verify that Ridley was destroyed, but he was out of the way for now, and activating the 12 Chozo totem artifacts summoned the spirits of the Chozo that were guiding Samus. They opened the entrance to the Impact Crater and hoped that Samus was the prophesied savior. 
Once she arrived inside the crater, she realized this was no ordinary meteor that collided with Talon IV. The Phazon as it spread was changing the planet itself, not just killing it from the inside. And space pirates never accessed the impact crater, yet Metroids were flourishing inside. In reality, one of the Phazon infused Metroids at some point escaped and passed through the barriers the Chozo placed in the cradle. Whatever the source of the Phazon infection was, was devoured by that single Metroid. Over time it grew, it fed, and it multiplied into various Metroids while it remained at the core of the impact, spurring on the spread of the Phazon energy. To stop the Phazon and the planet's destruction, Samus had to destroy that Metroid. This Metroid Prime had fed on Phazon for so long, it was unrecognizable. The worm seen in the Chozo prophecies. It was fully covered in a hard armor that was almost impenetrable, and it was strong. Samus identified a genetic flaw that caused it to be vulnerable against certain types of power beams for very short periods of time. And the Metroid Prime fired back, using technology absorbed from space pirate equipment and incorporated it to its own being. Eventually, Samus wore it down and damaged it enough to shed its protection and reveal its true and unprotected final form. The Phazon-powered essence of the Metroid Prime, only vulnerable to the same energy that powered it. Metroid Prime was destroyed, along with the source of the Phazon. Samus ran for the exit of the crater as it collapsed on itself. Without the Metroid Prime controlling the Phazon, the corruption was already clearing from the planet. In time, Talon IV would once again flourish with life. The Chozo spirits saw their planet saved and were free to return to the dimension they traveled from. Samus was a hero once again. But at the same time, she didn't quite understand what happened. When she gave the killing blow, Metroid Prime reached out and grabbed her, and her newly acquired Phazon suit vanished. What could that possibly mean? For now, her mission was a success, but she couldn't shake the feeling that this was only the beginning of something worse. Join me next time for the Metroid Timeline Part 4, The Ultimate Power, for a mission that sends Samus outside of Galactic Federation space into another galaxy. After a telepathic message is broadcast to the galaxy promising the secret to ultimate power, Samus sets out to claim or destroy it in a race against time, as several other bounty hunters receive the same message. And instead of power, they discover an ancient evil that could consume everything.
And if you'd like to support my work, I invite you to join my Patreon page. There's multiple levels of support to choose from. I'd also like to thank my current patrons and channel members that continue to support this channel. And if you enjoyed this video, leave me a like, subscribe, and click on the bell for all notifications. I'll catch you guys later.